if you'll stand with me and turn in your Bibles to 1 Timothy chapter 6. I'm going to read verses 17 through 19. I'll give you a minute to turn there. I was uh, reminded by someone a couple of weeks ago that uh, give us a moment to turn to the passage. And uh, I just assume you knew them by heart. You didn't need your Bible, but I guess, all right, you're there, right? 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 17, command those who are rich in this present age, <laughs> that's going to be a short study, command those who are rich in this present age not to be haughty, nor, trust, nor to trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who gives us richly all things to enjoy. Let them do good, that they may be rich in good works, ready to give, willing to share, storing up for themselves a good foundation for the time to come, that they may lay hold on eternal life. And Lord, of course, jesting, we uh, find ourselves probably not numbered, most of us anyway, not numbered among the rich, but yet your word is for all of us. And there's something here that we can learn and, and apply to our lives as well. So speak to us. By your Holy Spirit, in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. You may be seated. So here we find ourselves in the closing verses of 1 Timothy, as, as I've said. And Paul is making a bit of a distinction between two groups of people. If you remember in uh, this chapter, in verse 9, he writes to those who desire to be rich and fall into temptation and a snare, with many foolish and harmful lusts. And there are those who are not rich but want to be rich, and then there are those who are rich in this life or in this earthly life, and he mentions them in verse 17. Command those who are rich in this present age. He's not talking about spiritual riches. He's talking, it's certainly included, but he's talking about material wealth. Here are wealthy people. And remember, as Paul has been instructing Timothy throughout the course of this letter, on how the Christian church is supposed to behave, how it will function properly. And in the course of that, he's touched upon so many different types of church members, their, their functions, their church leaders, and their duties. Now he comes to a group of people that he hadn't really touched upon yet, and those are the wealthy people, the rich people. His concern is for them and their spiritual lives, but that they use their wealth in the proper way. Now, material wealth is certainly a blessing, and we can try to spiritualize poverty all we want, but we'd really be wrong in doing so. Let's face it, having money makes life a lot easier than if you don't have money, and so it's nice to have it. And we live in a day when we need money, and money can be easily accumulated, of course, and of course it's a lot easier to spend it. Uh, but we can become very wealthy in our day in many different ways. We maybe need the right idea. We can capitalize on a good idea, or we might need to be in the right place at the right time, or we just need to have the right numbers on that lotto ticket, and we become instantly wealthy. But the best way, and proven way, to win the golden ticket, if you will, is by good old-fashioned hard work and personal discipline. Solomon wrote, Wealth gained hastily will dwindle, but whoever gathers little by little will increase. Hard work, little by little. Just taking a little, saving a little, spending less. And uh, that's probably a wise approach to spending our money and, uh, and building our wealth. But what does it mean to be wealthy? According to a Wall Street Journal article dated in December of 2012, it says if you have a household income of $521,000 per year, you're in the top 1% of the nation's wealthiest. That's $521,000. That's all you need to be in the nation's top 1%. If your annual income is $208,000, then you are in the top 5%. If your annual income is $148,000 per year, you're in the top 10% of America's wealthiest. And if you 
have an annual household income of $108,000, you are in the top 20% of America's wealthiest people. That's all. $108,000 per year doesn't seem like a lot of money to me. Not that I make that much. I'm just saying it doesn't seem like a lot of money to be considered wealthy. That's making that much money annually. And that's combined income, meaning if husband and wife work and you make that much, you're considered to be in the top 20% of America's wealthiest. Now you turn that around, you go to the other side of this scale. According to the U.S. Census Bureau, a family of four that makes $23,021 per year will put you at the poverty level. A recent USA Today article stated, nationwide, the count of America's poor remains stuck at a record number, 46.2 million, or 15% of the population, due in part to lingering high unemployment following the recession. The article continues, while poverty rates for blacks and Hispanics are nearly three times higher, by absolute numbers, the predominant face of the poor is white. More than 19 million whites fall below the poverty line of $23,021 for a family of four, accounting for more than 41% of the nation's destitute, nearly double the number of poor blacks. Interesting. I don't know what we'll do with it, but I found it interesting. Now, you may be poor, you may be wealthy, but between those two figures, those two number levels, if you will, there's a lot of room, and that's probably where the majority of us live. You may not be wealthy, you may not be poor, but if you're making anywhere in between those two levels, then you are considered middle class, and according to the definition of middle class, they tell us that we are considered fortunate, and we're in a comfortable and in a good place. And if you are careful with your money, then you can manage a level of comfort and stability with, the, with your life. Either way, regardless if you're wealthy or poor, God wants us to be wise and spiritual with our money. Now, the Bible has a lot to say about money and our approach to it, our attitudes toward it, and our proper use of it. To put it in a nutshell, Jesus said, you can't serve God and money. He told a young rich ruler, if you want to be perfect, he said, then sell what you possess, give to the poor, and you'll have treasure in heaven, and then you can come and follow me. He also said that where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Now these verses are, are good verses to give us an attitude toward money, but it was more than that. This was his invitation for us to love heaven and spiritual things more than we love our money and our possessions and earthly things. Now those of us who are fortunate enough to have an income have a duty to use our funds for the glory of God. Now that's exactly what the Apostle Paul has been saying to the wealthy saints who are under Timothy's care. That's the purpose of him writing these comments as he reminds them that there's more to life than pampering ourselves, and that is that we look after one another, we look after others. And so Paul provides us with spiritual instruction. That's what this letter is, it's instruction. What the church is supposed to look like, what it's supposed to think like, and how it's supposed to behave. That's what this is about. And he begins with a negative, or if I may call it so, the perils of prosperity. The perils of prosperity. And the first peril is pride. The first peril is pride. He says, command those who are rich in this present age not to be haughty, proud. Wealthy people, of course, are at risk of being high-minded. In fact, some of the translations use the word high-minded thinking. Some rich people tend to be that way as they see themselves better than everyone else because they have a little more money. Or they see themselves as more important because they have greater priority, greater resource, and they have more uh, value than anyone else. We often accuse the wealthy of, of being snobbish and conceited. Oh, they think they're so it. And this is why often it's, it's come across that way. And what the Apostle Paul is saying is it shouldn't be that way. Wealthy people shouldn't think of themselves as better than other people. The second peril is the peril of possessions. 
Paul says again in our text, command those who are rich in this present age not to be haughty, nor to trust in uncertain riches, possessions. And the rich face this danger of placing their hopes or their confidence in the things that they possess, the things that they have. Now Jesus addressed this very issue in his letter to the church at Laodicea, which is found in Revelation chapter 3. Now, he first accused the Christians in Laodicea of being lukewarm. And then he cited the cause for their lukewarm condition, saying, for you say, saints at Laodicea, you say, I am rich, I have prospered, and I need nothing, and you don't even realize that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. So here are two perils of prosperity, pride and possession. And we can put ourselves in in those categories if we're not careful, if we think too highly of ourselves or if we think too highly of our possessions. But Paul wasn't writing these things to scold the rich. He was writing them to school the rich. And he makes these comments to teach us as well that there are positive ways or spiritual ways to approach our wealth, and that's what we want to talk about. And if I may, for the record, we don't uh, have to have a lot of money to apply these truths. We don't have to have anything to apply these truths to our lives, to be honest with you. And so Paul says, command those who are rich in this present age not to be haughty, nor to trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who gives us richly all things to enjoy. And the idea of this verse is it's teaching us to take our eyes off of ourselves, off of our resources, and put them on the Lord. Now, King David said this, some trust in chariots, some trust in horses, but we, we, the people of God, have learned to trust in the name of the Lord our God. That's where our confidence is found, not in the things that we possess. That's what he's saying. In the same way, we mustn't trust in our riches. And whether we have a little or a lot really doesn't matter but what does matter is that we learn to look to Jesus in all of life's circumstances and we do so because we know that God is the one who gives us richly all things to enjoy he is our provider he is the one who gives us everything that we need in this life and even sometimes the things that we enjoy or the pleasures of life now how much we possess is really no match for how much God wants to possess you and how much he wants to use you for his glory and for his purposes and for his kingdom. And and God can use and bless others through you whether you have a little or whether you have a lot. But if we trust in our own resources, then we may never be able to help anyone. We may never be able to see God using us if all we have is our limitations of our own resources. And if God is our supplier, then the sky's the limit. So don't let your wealth or your lack of wealth be the gauge of how significantly God can use you. Now, in 1 Kings chapter 17, we find the story of Elijah the prophet who relied on the Lord's provision. Wonderful story. The Lord uh, wanted to protect Elijah. He was on the lamb. People were after him. So the Lord protected him preserved him, sent ravens with bread and meat to feed him. He drank water from the brook uh, Cherith that was there and until the brook dried up and the food source ran out. And then the Lord told Elijah, get up and go to Zarephath, saying, I have commanded a widow there to provide for you. Someone there is going to take care of you. You go and you'll, you'll find out that I can provide. Well, he went And Elijah met the widow. When he found her, he asked her for a drink and a morsel of bread. But she said, As the Lord your God lives, I have nothing baked, only a handful of flour in a jar and a little oil in a jug. And now I am gathering a couple of sticks so that I can go in and prepare it for myself and for my son so that we may eat it and die. (laughs) What a horrible story! That sounds terrible. I mean, we're so poor, 
we're, we're, this is our last meal. We're going to go and fix this meal. And you're asking me for a piece of bread? I don't have any bread. I don't have anything. This is all we've got. And we're going to go eat it and we're going to die. That's it. And Elijah said to her, don't be afraid. Go ahead and do just what you've said, but make a little bread for me first, then use what's left to prepare a meal for yourself and your son. The jar of flour shall not be spent, says the Lord, and the jug of oil shall not be empty until that day that the Lord sends rain upon the earth. <laughs> what a nice guy. Feed me first, and you'll be fine. But this was actually a bit of a test of faith. Feed me first. Give it up first. And she went and did as Elijah said. And she, it tells us in Scripture, she and he, Elijah, and her household, her son, ate for many days. There was always enough flour and olive oil left in the containers, just as the Lord had promised through Elijah. And the lesson we take away from this is that she was not limited by what little she possessed. None of us are. She trusted in the Lord by faith. And she believed that God would provide for her needs. And she believed that by faith, not by what she saw with her eyes. Why, she even took care of the needs of a perfect stranger, Elijah. Feed me first, he said. What's left you can feed yourself and watch what God will do. That's what faith looks like. And by faith, God provides for us in the same way, according to his riches, and out of his possessions, not ours. You know, there's a set of books, Old and New Testament, they're called the Apocryphal Books. There's one book that is an Old Testament book. We don't see them as anointed scripture, but still, they're historic, and they're, there's some value to them. There's a book of Tobit in the fourth chapter, and this is what's written there. <coughs> Excuse me. Give alms for your substance, and do not turn away your face from any pauper, for so it shall be that neither will the face of the Lord be turned away from you. In whatever way that you are able, so shall you be merciful. If you have much, distribute abundantly. If you have little, nevertheless strive to bestow a little freely. For you store up for yourself a good reward for the day of necessity. For almsgiving liberates from every sin and from death, and it will not suffer the soul to go into darkness, or it will not allow the soul to go into darkness. Almsgiving will be a great act of faith before the Most High God for all those who practice it. Now, regardless of what you may think about the apocryphal writings, that's a good quote. It's a good quote as it puts the truth and our faith into powerful perspective, if you will, because that's how faith works. And whether you're upper class or you consider yourself middle class or lower class or no class, we're all supposed to use what we possess for the glory of God and for his kingdom, and we do that by faith. And with that said, Paul takes us now into more positive instruction on how to use our wealth. As he said, to the wealthy, let them do good. You rich people, do good, that they may be rich in good works. Now, they may already be wealthy in this present age, but the more important thing is to be wealthy in the age to come. We know this. Now, the only way to do that, of course, is by investing in the kingdom work, or as he words it, by being rich in good works. And so here the wealthy are to be actively working for God. Now you may be a CEO of a huge corporation, you may be the leader of a branch of government or the owner of a successful business, but if you're a Christian, you work for Jesus. That's who you work for, period. And that's the only way that you can become rich in good works, because if you're not in Christ, then the works that you do cannot earn you a place in heaven. And that's not how works work. Our works are only for rewards once we get into heaven, but we only get into heaven, th heaven through faith in Jesus Christ, not by any works, any stretch of the word. We only arrive there through faith, but once we're in the faith, we have work to do, and those works will be rewarded. Okay, well, let's look at this practically. What 
can a wealthy person do for the kingdom of God? The answer, anything he wants to. Whatever he wants to do, he can do it. Because having money does not exclude you or prevent you from serving the Lord and working for the kingdom of God. A wealthy person can serve God in any capacity and at any time, wherever he wants to, just as well as anyone else can, wealthy or not. However, having said that, we know that running a successful business or holding a prominent position uh, or sitting in a seat of, of responsibility often limits one's availability to serve in traditional or normal fashions as we think of church service. And certain professions, of course, have duties and, and time restraints which actually can place extreme demands on a person and on their schedule. Remember, that's how they became wealthy, through hard work. And hard work often implies many, many hours. It's, it goes with the territory. And so if you need to find other ways of investing in God's work, then you must do so. One of the more obvious ways, of course, is by monetary donations. If rich people have money, use your money. Use your money for the glory of God. And as we've seen within our context of our passage, that's what the, the apostles talking about, verse 18. Let them do good that they be rich in good works, ready to give, willing to share. Now, you may be able to give your time now and then. Uh, you may be able to help within the church now and then. You may be able to help a person's private welfare. If you own a business or so, you might be able to find someone a job and help them out. Those are ways that you can certainly help and be used by God in your position and influence. You can do those sorts of things without breaking or violating any laws, of course. But rich people also have the power of money. And they have money that can be used to ease the suffering of others. Though uh, wealthy people can have a reputation of being tight-fisted, as Christians, you're to be generous. And once again, it doesn't matter if you're rich or poor. We're to be generous. Now, uh, you notice how Paul puts it, be rich in good works, ready to give, willing to share, meaning you're generous. You're, you're willing to give up what you have to help others. And he says that you're to be rich in good works, meaning that you're using your wealth as often as you can. Rich, you're, you're using it a lot and not withholding good when it is in your power to do so. That's what James said in James chapter 4. He said, remember, it is sin to know what you ought to do, but not to do it. It's a sin. Hebrews 13 and verse 16 says, don't forget to do good and to share what you have with those who are in need. For these are the sacrifices that please God. And of course, this is how we become rich in good works. By using what we have for the, for the sake of others and for the glory of God. And Paul once again said, be ready to give, willing to share. Ready and willing here imply an eagerness with a cheerful heart of giving. Of course, we know what the Apostle Paul said to the Corinthians about this. In 2 Corinthians chapter 9, in verse 6, he said, Whoever sows sparingly or tight-fistedly will also reap sparingly. Whoever sows generously will also reap generously. You must each decide in your heart how much you're willing to give. And don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure, for God loves a person who gives cheerfully. Cheerfully. That's the attitude that we're supposed to have when we give and if we give. We're supposed to decide how much we can give. You know, no one's supposed to pressure us. You shouldn't give more than what your conscience will allow you, what your cheerfulness will allow. That should be a bit of a guide for you. And this is how we store up treasures in heaven. And it's how we become rich in good works. So don't be stingy with what you have. Be generous. Generosity with the right heart, Paul said, is how they'll be, verse 19, storing up for themselves a good foundation for the time to come that they may lay hold on eternal life. Or as someone has put it, what I kept I lost, what I gave I have. That's a good lesson. And having wealth is, is not sin at all, but but holding on to it and not using it for the glory of God could very well become sin. Having wealth is, is a, as a Christian is a great responsibility. 
Christians. We know there exists a powerful attraction to possession, to materialism. There is a dangerous affection toward wealth. John called it the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. Paul called it the love of money, which is the root of all kinds of evil, which will actually bring all sorts of trouble your way and lead you even into personal bondage. But having a sincere love for God, having a sensible love for people, has an opposite effect upon your life as it really can liberate you. As we read from Tobit, almsgiving liberates from every sin and from death and it will not suffer the soul to go into darkness. Have you ever read that, uh, or perhaps watched the film, the Charles Dickens Christmas classic, A Christmas Carol? Remember, it's the story of Ebenezer Scrooge and his conversion, really, from being a bitter old miser into a generous and kind man. You know the story quite well. We all watch it about 20 times around Christmas time. It should be fresh in your mind. Scrooge being portrayed as, quote, a squeezing, wrenching, grasping, scraping, clutching, covetous old sinner, end quote. He hates Christmas, calling it humbug. He re refused an invitation from his one and only nephew, Fred, his only living relative. He didn't want to go near him on Christmas dinner invitation. A couple of guys came to his door looking for a donation to help the poor, to feed the poor. He chased them away. He didn't want to help, even around Christmas time. In fact, his only Christmas gift, if you recall, and if you would call it a Christmas gift, was that he allowed his, his abused overworked, underpaid clerk, Bob Cratchit, Christmas Day off with pay, and he did so reluctantly. In fact, Scrooge called it a poor excuse for picking a man's pocket every 25th of December. That's tight-fisted. You know the story that Christmas Eve, as he slept, he received a visit from his, his dead friend, Jacob Marley, who announced that there would be a coming, a visitation of three ghosts, the ghost of Christmas past, Christmas present, and yet to come. Christmas is yet to come. And these ghosts took him on a tour and, and showed him a snapshot of his tight-fisted, miserable life, and they offered him an opportunity to become a new person, to become a new man, or else. Scrooge woke up on Christmas morning, a changed man. Joy in his heart, love in his heart. He went on to spend the day with his nephew Fred. He giggled as he purchased and sent the prized turkey to the Cratchit home for Christmas dinner, you remember. The next day he gave Bob Cratchit a raise and became like a second father to the crippled tiny Tim. And Ebenezer Scrooge had become a changed man, a liberated man as he began to treat everyone else with kindness and generosity and compassion. And as the story ends, God bless us, everyone. We know that story. We love it. But can it really be true that someone can be so liberated from the grip of possession and money? I don't know that it will be as dramatic for you when or if you have your transformation, but... It will definitely be a liberating experience, and that I can promise you, because money does possess you. Money does make you its prisoner. Possessions will possess you if you allow it. And the only way to be free from its grip is to give it away. Oh, give it away. I, I don't know how to say it any other way, but if you can see how that God has blessed you with wealth for that reason... That reason only, to, to grow his kingdom and, and to bless other people with your finances, then you will be free. We're to be wise, of course, with our money. We're to be spiritually minded about it. And we're to look for proper ways to use our wealth for the kingdom of God. Because that's how we store up for ourselves a good foundation for the time to come that we may lay hold on eternal life. We get the eternal thing. We get it. That's how we lay hold on. We, we get it. It's not about this life. 
It's not about this world. It's, it's beyond this life, beyond this world. And as we say, we cannot take it with us. So we use it for the glory of God. Now Paul has already used this phrase telling Timothy, fight the good fight of faith and lay hold on eternal life. And this is how he tells us to do that. This is how we get into the game, if you will, to do our part. Paul, writing to the Ephesians in chapter 4, said, As each part does its own special work, it helps the other parts grow, so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. And the idea, of course, we all have a part to play in this, in this growth of the church and in the kingdom of God. Every one of us has a part to play. And we're each responsible to find out what that part is and then to perform our part. But before we go that far, you have to understand whether or not you are a part of the body of Christ. Are you a part of the body of Christ? The only way to become a part of the body of Christ is to believe in Christ. If you're not a Christian, then, then you belong to this world. If you're not a Christian, then according to the Bible, you are still under the sway of the wicked one. You're under his influence. And you can break that power today by giving your life over to Jesus Christ. But it's your decision because Jesus doesn't kick the door of your heart down. He knocks. In Revelation 3, he said that, Behold, I stand at the door of your heart and I knock. And the idea is he wants to come into your life. He wants you to give your life to him. He'll not kick the door open. He only stands waiting for an invitation. Will you invite him in? That's the question. Let's pray. Lord, we pray that this morning would be a day of deliverance in more ways than one. For some, we need to be delivered from possession and materialism. We need to be set free. For others, we need to be set free from sin, the sin that holds us to this world. I pray, God, if there's anyone here today who has yet to turn their life to Jesus, then, then Lord, you have the power to, to continue knocking upon the door of their heart so that they'll hear. And I pray that they would respond to your plea, your desire to change them. If you want to be changed today, if you want to be a new person, if you want to be converted, then ask Jesus into your heart. I'll help you. I'll, I'll pray with you. I, I'll lead you in a prayer. Say this in your heart. Just say, Jesus, I want you to come into my heart. I want you to come into my life and make me a new person. I always thought it was all about how much I can accumulate, what I could do for pleasures in this world, but those things have never brought me pleasure. Maybe temporary pleasure at best, but I know there's still the emptiness in my life, so I come to you today and I give you my life. Come in, Lord. Forgive me of my sins. Make my life brand new. And from this day forward, I live for you. Teach me what that means and how I might be able to do that properly for you and for your glory. And in your name I pray. Amen.